it's an exciting time to kind of be into origami and math. Um, the, uh, because in addition to people who are using it for education, there's just a lot, and in fact, more and more research being going on just in terms of do we understand origami? Do, you know, what kind of questions can we ask? How can we understand how things fold more? And Robert Lang is certainly a, a, a leader um, in understanding scientific technical origami, and he's working on stuff that, that, that no one else is, is, is at right now. Um, and we form a pretty tight community. There, in addition to Robert Lang, there is Eric Demain, who's at MIT, and his father, Martin. Um, there are other researchers. Um, I have some uh, collaborators at the University of Massachusetts, which is very close to, to where I work at, at Western New England University. Um, and they're physicists, and they, they are interested in, they, they created this kind of plastic polymer material that they can program in such a way and, and, and synthesize in such a way that, so that when they shine light on it, it'll fold up along some crease pattern. And they want the help of people like me and Robert Lang to help, to help them learn how to optimize this polymer technology that they, they're designing. Um, so, because they want to, they, they can make these things really, really tiny, like nanoscale, small. They want to be able to master the control of this, of this medium they have so that they can try to build things with it. Um, and there's enough people excited about that kind of stuff, building things at the nano level with folding processes that there's actual, in, in the United States, there's actual National Science Foundation grant opportunities to fund that kind of research. So, so the government and the military is, is willing to put money into studying this kind of stuff. Um, so all of us are kind of in communicating more, doing uh, things together more. Um, it feeds into the education part of it, but it's also things that people are interested in just because they think this is valuable. I mean, it's hard, you know, anyone who does origami and looks at super complicated models, it, it's at some point you think, how can we get more complicated than this? You know, is there ever going to be a limit? And I, I, I'm continuously surprised that there's always new avenues to go into. And this model that um, that's, was designed by Robert Lang really does, is an example of it. So, so this is a model that, um, that Robert Lang designed on his computer. Uh, he basically started with a cone, uh, a pleated cone. Like imagine the bottom level of this, just all these pleats, continuing up, forgetting about the rest, continuing up and meeting at some point. It would make some pleated cone. And then he wanted to slice that cone in, in certain ways. And along the slices, he wanted to uh, sink it down, up, down, up, down, up. And if you make those slices parallel, well, then you just have a normal multiple sink that you see in a lot of, a lot of origami models that, that go back. Although it would be a big one, <laughs> a little more complicated. But instead of doing that, he angled the pleats in such a way so that you got this curved bowl-like shape emerging from just these multiple sinks. But he designed this on a computer using a program called Mathematica. And, and with that program, he was able to simulate this and make, the, make a computer drawing of, of this model. But that didn't mean he could fold it. And sometimes you do design things on a computer that are just too hard to fold or, 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 or too hard to realize an actual paper. Um, so he tried, fold, from what I understand, he told me he tried folding this. and. Uh, and gave up after a while, it was too tedious, he didn't want to spend the time on it. I'm sure he could have if he really, really wanted to, but, but, but he gave up on it. But then he shared the crease pattern with some other origamists, and, it, and in particular he sent it to uh, an origami artist in Brooklyn, New York, named Ray, Sh uh, Ray Sidney Champ. He printed out the crease pattern on really nice paper and brought copies of it to one of the Origami USA conventions in New York City, in particular in the one in 2011, and gave them out to people, and I was lucky enough to get one, and then that summer I, I managed to get it to fold, and it did take a long time, but, uh, but the crease pattern is printed on here, so I, I, I literally you know, pinched or scored the whole crease pattern first, then tried like the diggins to get it to all collapse. But it does give you a shape that you wouldn't have gotten any other way, I think, if, other than designing this first on a computer technically. Um, I'm not sure, even if we had thought of doing this by hand, I don't, know if, I don't think there would have been a way to start with a blank piece of paper and get this just by finding landmarks and stuff. That, that just would have been too insane. <laughs> a lot, so a lot of people do say like, well, if you're using a computer to design origami, you know, what, where is the creative process? But the computer didn't design this. The computer was a tool to help realize a model like this. It's still the creativity of the human mind, in particular Robert Lang's mind, 
that came up with this idea. And his brilliance was ab able to take that idea and, and use what he knows about origami and math to model it on a computer and see that, okay, it could work on a computer. It allows him, it, it allows him to create a better design loop so that he can take ideas, model them on a computer, and at least get a sense, okay, this could work in reality using a, a lot less time than he would if he had to just fold this from scratch. If folding this from scratch was the only way he could explore this idea, he never would have even done it. I mean, he, he didn't even want, <laughs> want to finish folding it when he did design it with a computer, right? But, um, so I view, I view computers as like, kind of like the ultimate design tool um, that doesn't take away from the creative process, but accentuates the creative process. And then when you fold it, you, you know, there's lots of things that you have to do as an artist to try to achieve this artistically. Um, and uh, and that, that's beyond what the computer can do too. Um, if I was to show you the computer program that did this, it, it looks very cold and sterile. The fact that this is folded from elephant hide paper and, and you know, none of the creases, the creases in the center aren't perfect gives it a more, okay, a human folded this <laughs> kind of feel and makes it maybe a little bit more organic, something you might see in nature than just something that might have been laser cut or something like that. So, so there's still a lot of wiggle room. The computer doesn't take away, I think, necessarily from, from the, the human element of the creative process. Yeah, so, so this model um, is one of my designs and I like it because it's, um, there's a lot of math in here, and, but there's also a lot of me working as an origami artist trying to get something like this to work. Um, this is a, 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 a an origami model with lots of pleats. It fit, fits into something what people might call a corrugation fold or, or geometric origami type of fold. And I like this kind of origami because I like geometry, I like math. I, I find this kind of pattern folding very aesthetically pleasing. But I also really like it when we can make it dynamic and not just, you know, you know when, when the, the, the pleats are going off in weird angles and spinning around and making something like a fluid motion that you wouldn't necessarily expect. I also like origami a geometric origami that challenges your eye to see like, how, well, was this folded from a flat piece of paper or what shape piece of paper was this folded from? Because it looks like there's more paper here than you would get by just smoothing something out. Um, and I'm able to sometimes, when I'm lucky, achieve that by co combining normal folding techniques with wet folding. And, uh, and for people who know what wet folding is, this doesn't look wet folded because you, normally with wet folding you, you have um, the paper warping a little bit because the, when paper gets wet, it tends to buckle and warp. And that's an effect that people use to ar artistic um, uh, merits in animal type of origami. But in geometric origami, you don't normally expect to see it. So I had to be very careful when wet folding this. But it was only by wet folding could I get it to stay in this shape, this kind of curved shape. Otherwise, it would look much more angular and not nearly as fluid. But mathematically, what I was trying to achieve with this is that if I was to collapse this a bit more, if I was to take some of these points and bring them together, like these two points, these two points, these two points, and, and then on the bottom too, what I would get is a bunch of triangles, and this would have the structure of, of uh, a geometric polyhedron object called an octahedron. And the boundary of the paper would be tracing out uh, a circuit or a path on the, the edges of that octahedron that covers the whole all of the edges of the octahedron just goes all the way around it, not repeating any edge twice. And that's something called an Eulerian circuit in uh, polyhedral graph theory. So I was trying to take that mathematical uh, pattern topic, Eulerian circuits on, on polyhedral objects, and capture it in origami in a way that I thought would be interesting. And, and when I can do that, I, 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 well, I just, I'm pleased <laughs> because um, because then I'm taking a mathematical pattern and expressing it in an artistic medium so that people might be able to see visually this mathematical thing that you are, otherwise wouldn't see unless you were studying math in a class or reading a math book or something. So, so I feel this was pretty successful. But it's also just pretty to enjoy anyway, even if you don't know the math. So that works too. Gosh. The future of origami is, is so hard to predict. You know, um, If I was to try to predict where things were, in 1990, like if I was in 1990 trying to predict where things would be now, um, I don't think I would have guessed that someone like Satoshi Kamiya would have come by and, and revived box pleating techniques in, 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 and raised the complexity of origami another notch, you know. Um, but there's so much unexplored 
potential for in, in geometric origami, origami tessellations, representational origami, um, that all of those branches of origami that we see now, modular origami, I, they're going to continue to grow, continue to surprise us, continue to find new, you know, new avenues. Um, and what I have no idea about is what, what's going to be new. You know, what type of artistic expression are we going to be able to find in origami so that there, it opens up a whole other genre of, I don't know, origami um, rock and plant folds or something like that. You know, that, that, the, the, who knows what kind of new thing might emerge that, uh, that allows us to explore things in ways that we haven't already thought of. Um, origami continues to surprise us. We've been doing it for so long, it's never going to get static. In the same way that music's never going to get static or, or poetry or haiku. Haven't we had all the haiku yet already? No, we haven't. So we're not going to run out of origami. It's, it's going to be awesome.